Let me just say right off the bat that uh, in what I do, I travel a lot, and I, I know about every state think tank in the country, and this is one of the very best that you have right here in Missouri. And uh, so get involved, get behind it, give it your time, your energy, your money, and I think you'll find it's a really good investment. <coughs> now, if you Google the John Goodman Health Policy blog, you're going to find two things. First of all, you're going to find this is just about the only health policy blog that approaches health policy from an economic point of view. And by that I mean that the folks that blog with me believe that the reason we're having so many problems in health care is that people face perverse economic incentives. And when they act on those incentives, they make costs higher, quality lower, access more difficult than it otherwise would have been. And if we're going to solve these problems, we have to get the economic incentives right. The other thing you're going to find in our blog is it's the only health policy blog of any persuasion whatsoever that has a sense of humor. <laughs> I don't know what it is about the field I'm in, but it's dominated by a bunch of sourpusses. And uh, not only do most of them not have a sense of humor, they don't even know when I'm joking. This includes Paul Krugman at the New York Times. <laughs> and if I'm too subtle, as I guess I have been once or twice, it's gotten me a lot of trouble. So we created this... Uh, this, uh, this, this yield sign, this, uh, for, it's called a satire alert for the humor challenge. <laughs> and so when you see that uh, next to one of the blog items, you'll know, don't take this item totally seriously. <laughs> we feel like if we don't make you smile at least once a day, we're not doing our job at the blog. So we'll do things like we had a post the other day on how Obamacare is going to push all of you into HMOs, it's going to ration your care. And then uh, underneath that, we got from YouTube Aretha Franklin singing, Say a Little Prayer for You. Uh, and then we had a post the other day on End of Life Care, and underneath that was Bob Dylan singing, Knocking on Heaven's Door. <laughs> <laughs> then we had this post where the insurance guys and the doctors just went back and forth, and there must have been 50 or 60 comments just really going at each other. Finally, this doctor got so exasperated, he said, you know, your insurance guys are killing our patients. <coughs> And so I thought that deserved reposting, and I did it, and uh, along with some other comments, but under that one I had Leslie Gore singing, you'd cry too if it happened to you. <laughs> Sometimes we're accused of being insensitive and irreverent, and I think the worst thing we ever did happened about two years ago. There was a man who walked into the Parkland Hospital emergency room in Dallas, and he waited 19 hours and died before he ever saw a doctor. Uh, and we thought that was tragic, and we also thought this probably could happen in other cities as well. So we did a little post on it, but underneath it we had Lionel Richie singing all night long, and that probably was a little bit insensitive on our part. Uh, when I talk, uh, I usually have a cell phone with me, because you never know when you're going to have an emergency, even when you're giving a talk, right? That wasn't serious. But this is serious. Uh, there are more cell phones in the United States uh, than there are people. In fact, even the panhandler out on the street corner probably has a cell phone, even though he probably doesn't have very good access to health care. If something goes wrong with my iPhone, uh, there are dozens of places in Dallas that I can walk into with no appointment, and I can get fast, uh, low-cost, high-quality repairs uh, uh, in a very convenient way. There are even shops that will send a repair person to my condo to repair my, uh, my iPhone in my home. Uh, there's a national chain called iHospital, and the employees are called iDoctors. But on the other hand, if something happens to my body, <coughs> did you know that the wait to see a new doctor in the United States for a new patient is now three weeks? In Boston, where we're told they have universal coverage, the wait is two months to see a new doctor. And as for going to emergency rooms, uh, did you know that one out of every five people in the United States that goes to an emergency room leaves without ever seeing a doctor just because people get tired of waiting? So my question to you is, why is the market so kind to my iPhone and so mean to me? And I think the answer is if this phone is bought and sold and repaired in a real market with real prices where entrepreneurs know if they solve our problems, they can make millions of dollars. Whereas over in healthcare, we have completely suppressed the market, and we've done it for decade after decade, and we've suppressed it so much that none of us ever sees a real price for anything. No doctor, no patient, no employee, no employer. We've unfortunately bought into this notion, which is common throughout the developed world, 
And that's the idea that the way you make healthcare accessible is you want it to be free at the point of delivery. And what we forgot when we did that was if you completely suppress the price, if you really do make healthcare free at the point of delivery, then the most important barriers to care are going to be the non-price barriers, which mainly have to do with time. And what we have overlooked is that those time barriers may be more important than the price barriers to care. Now, um, we basically, in the United States, we like to think that we're different from Canada and England and Europe, but, but I guarantee you that, that we're a lot more similar than we are different. We, mainly in the United States, pay for care with time and not money, just as the Canadians, just as the Britons. Now, what do I mean, really, by non-price barriers to care? I mean, um, how long does it take you on the telephone to get someone on the other end of the line to give you an appointment with a doctor? How many days do you have to wait before you can see that doctor? How long does it take you to get from your home or your office to the doctor's office? And then how long do you have to wait um, there in the doctor's office before you get to see the doctor? Those are non-price barriers to care. There's lots of evidence that those non-price barriers are, are more important obstacles to seeing doctors than the fee the doctor charges. And that's not only true for the middle class, it's also true for low-income patients. In this country, there are right now almost 50 million people who are on food stamps. People with food stamps can walk into any supermarket you and I can walk into. They can buy almost any product we buy. They pay the same prices we pay. They go to the checkout counter, they put their food stamps down, their money on top of it, they consummate their transaction uh, in, just as you and I do. Uh, you never ever hear it said that poor people in the United States have a lack of access to supermarkets, right? Now they may have to get on a bus and go you know, some blocks to get to one, but you never hear of a supermarket saying, we're not taking any more food stamps from our customers, right? I mean, that just doesn't happen. But over in healthcare, there are about 60 million people on Medicaid, and a lot of them are the very same people that, that have the food stamps. And those Medicaid patients, uh, their biggest problem is what? It's finding a doctor who will see them. I was in Boston uh, not long ago, and I struck up a conversation with a female cab driver, and as I often do, I just ask her how the healthcare system was working. And she says, well, you know, I guess it's all right, but I'm having trouble finding a doctor who will see me. And I said, well, well tell me about it. She said she was on MassHealth, which is Massachusetts Medicaid. And she said she went down a list of 20 names before she could find a doctor who would see her. I said, were you going down the yellow pages? And she said, no, no, I was going down the list that Medicaid gave me. Um, so what do Medicaid patients do? All too often around the country, they show up at community health centers and at the emergency rooms of safety net hospitals like Parkland and Dallas. Now, the average patient isn't going to wait 19 hours. But if, at the emergency room in my city, at Parkland, a four, five, or six hour wait would not be unusual. Uh, if you walk in bleeding all over the floor, they're going to tend to you. But if you walk in with a migraine headache, you could be there all day long before the doctor actually sees you. At the same time that all this is going on, we have in this country about 1,300 walk-in clinics. And they are in CVS Pharmacy where they're called Minute Clinic. And as the name implies, uh, uh, they're telling you they know your time is valuable as well as your money. But they're also in Walmart and they're in shopping malls. Uh, these Minute Clinics are staffed by nurses who are using computerized protocols on the screen. They can prescribe electronically. They can keep your records uh, electronically. Uh, they're providing very high quality care. As a matter of fact, they adhere to evidence-based protocols more frequently than traditional primary care doctors. So it's high quality medicine, it's low cost medicine. Uh, but here's the problem. In Dallas, Texas, if you have a sore throat or you have an earache, the charge of the Minute Clinic is about $75. <coughs> Medicaid only pays half that amount. So none of the Medicaid patients get to go to the Minute Clinic. Now you might ask, well, why don't they take money out of their pocket and add it to the Medicaid rate and just pay the market rate for their care? And the answer to that is because we make it illegal. More than illegal, we make it a matter of the criminal law. So nurse actually took cash from a Medicaid patient, she could go to jail, is that right? And the doctor tells me I'm right about that. All right, so why is it that over in the food area, we let people do rational things, pay the market price, have great access to care, but in healthcare we don't. We can greatly, greatly expand uh, access to care overnight all across America just by letting low-income people purchase um, healthcare the very same way they purchase food. 
If we want to solve the nation's health care problems, we've got to start by liberating patients. We've got to get rid of silly rules and restrictions like that one and give them access to a real marketplace. The second thing we've got to do is we've got to liberate the doctor. You know, doctors are the only professionals in our society who are not free to repackage and reprice their services whenever demand changes, technology changes, or anything else changes. Every other professional, the lawyers, the accountants, the engineers, the architects, if demand changes, technology changes, they can change what they offer to the market, they can change the price they charge, but doctors are total slaves to a third-party payment system which dictates to them the fees and what will be paid for and what will not. Have you uh, ever noticed that uh, it's really, really difficult to get a doctor to talk to you on the phone? You know, all the other professionals have been doing it for almost a century. But doctors haven't gotten around to it. Uh, now, my doctor friend might call me back if I'm inviting him out to dinner and I'm paying, but uh, for, uh, for normal consultation, it's really hard to get uh, a doctor to talk to you on the phone. See if I know why that is. What is it? A reimbursement price. Ah, he doesn't get paid. Ah. You know, Medicare has a list of 7,500 tasks that it pays doctors to perform. <coughs> And there is no more stupid way to pay a professional than to write down all the tasks and say, we're only going to pay for this task, and here are the amounts that we're going to pay. Uh, it just so happens that whenever you do that, you're going to leave the important things off, but what they left off was the telephone. And, uh, and the way Medicare pays, Blue Cross pays the same way, as far as they're all copying Medicare. And uh, so basically, this is, this is, these are non-billable minutes, hours. Okay? And with the doctors having their third-party payers pushing down on their fees. They can't afford to spend very much time on non-billable activities. We get to the end of the 20th century and all the rest of you discover email. Everybody's emailing everybody these days. Even the corner liquor store emails me if uh, they have a bottle of wine they know I'm going to want. Um, you know, even the Minute Clinic emails me. Uh, they emailed me in August and said, you know, it's school time. Your kids are going to need, you know, their shots. And they emailed me the other day and said it's flu time, time to get a shot. But I never get an email like that from a doctor. And why is that? See, you were so good last time. This is an easy pop quiz. You just keep repeating this answer. You're an A plus exam. Uh, that's one of the other items not on the list of 7,500. There are a lot of really other important things that Medicare leaves off its list, but I want to tell you about one that I think is rather remarkable. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey Brenner, any of you heard of him? Hot spots, is that a, you've heard of that? Okay. Dr. Brenner is, uh, lives in Camden, New Jersey, which uh, I'm told is one of the poorest places in the whole country. Uh, people who live in Camden, they're either on Medicare or Medicaid or they're uninsured. There's hardly any private insurance. Uh, Brenner is an entrepreneur, he's a scientist, he's a researcher. He's going through the hospital records trying to figure out where all the money's going. And he discovers that 1% of all the patients in Camden are responsible for 30% of all the money the hospital spends. So he goes down that list of patients and he finds out one particularly egregious case. This is a man who weighs more than 600 pounds. And he's a drug addict, and he's an alcoholic, and he's diabetic, and he's a mess. And he spends about half the year in the hospital. And when he's not in the hospital, he's abusing his body. So Brenner takes this guy under his wing, and he gets him off the alcohol, gets him off the drugs, and rolls him in AA. He finds out the guy's a Christian, so he gets him going to church. Uh, he gets him to sign up for some welfare programs so he can get some stability in his life, financial stability. And as a result of all that, the, uh, the hospital uh, stays keep going down, 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 so his cost keeps going down, down, down. So he's saving tens of thousands of dollars on this one patient. Uh, by doing what? Which is, is really not even medicine. We're talking about social work here. Now, that worked so well that Brenner got some colleagues together and they started uh, 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 finding other patients who are really high cost patients uh, where there's a real potential to save money if you just change their lifestyle. And Brenner tells me he can drive down the streets of Camden, he can point to whole buildings, and he can tell me how much that whole building is costing Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, and he's saving them millions of dollars. So here's my question to you tonight. Um, how much do you think Medicare gives back to Dr. Brenner for all the millions of dollars he's saving we as taxpayers? Zero. 
oh, Ziva, that's good. <laughs> that didn't take you long. Uh, why? Because social work just isn't one of the things Medicare pays for, right? Now, how about Medicaid? How much do you think Medicaid gives from all the millions of dollars of savings in the state of New Jersey? Zero. Okay. At my blog, I said this is a huge mistake. Uh, we ought to let Jeffrey Brenner become a millionaire. Uh, he called me up and thanked me for that idea. <laughs> um, what I said was, look, if he saves a taxpayer dollar, we ought to let him keep at least 20 cents. And, um, and then once we do that, we ought to send out a letter to every other doctor in America saying, look, if you can think of a way to save taxpayers money and raise the quality of care that patients receive, you want to be paid a different way, you tell us, and we'll, we'll pay you. Uh, as long as we're saving money, improving care, uh, we need to get away from this idea that Washington needs to tell doctors how to practice medicine. They know a lot more than the bureaucrats. We just need to liberate them. Now, the third thing we need to do is liberate the entrepreneur. Uh, I'm often asked if um, the markets can really work in healthcare. And um, my response is the only place that healthcare really works well is where markets are allowed to work. You show me a healthcare service where there's no Blue Cross, no employer, uh, no Medicare, and I'll show you a market that, look, that works pretty well. Uh, just looking around this room, I would guess that um, most of you don't know very much about the market for cosmetic surgery. Uh, but, you know, give another 10 years. <laughs> Here's a market where the third party payers aren't, and over the last 10, 15 years, the, the demand has just soared. The number of procedures has gone up by 500, 600 percent. Uh, all kinds of technological change of the type we're told increases costs everywhere else. Uh, and yet in this market, the price, the real price, has gone down, down, down over that period of time, even as the real price of every other kind of surgery has gone up. Uh, this is a market where you get a package price covering the doctor, the nurse, the facilities, uh, and so forth. Uh, one price, uh, unlike any, every other kind of surgery, and uh, so you have price transparency, and you didn't need a law to get that transparency. It's just emerges in the, in the marketplace. Lasik surgery. Uh, similarly, all the people in this market are paying with their own money. You get package prices, you have price competition, quality competition. Uh, over the last 10 years, the real price of Lasik surgery has gone down by 25%. I've already mentioned the walk-in clinics. Almost all of those came into existence mainly to cater to people who are spending with their own money. They didn't come into existence uh, for insurance companies. Uh, Rx.com was the first mail order prescription drug uh, house. Uh, it came, it goes online, it came, it came online to compete with the local pharmacies. Again, for people paying out of their own pocket. Uh, here is a higher quality, lower qual cost alternative to the pharmacy down the street. Uh, Teladoc of Dallas actually does let you talk to doctors on the phone. Here again, mainly coming to the market. They've got two million patients now. We do it for our employees. We pay a dollar a month to these guys. Uh, if I uh, am here in St. Louis and I want a prescription filled and I call and I get it, I don't know what doctor I'm going to get, but he'll have my electronic medical records and he'll know what, 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 I've, what my medical history and he can prescribe electronically. And there again is how markets respond to needs, uh, provided we don't have third-party bureaucracies uh, getting in, their way, in the way. This is totally the opposite of the Obama administration's approach uh, to healthcare change. And their approach is that the innovations have to start in Washington. And you have heard Barack Obama say this uh, probably on more than one occasion. He says, the way we're going to solve the healthcare problem is we're going to go out and we're going to study it and we're going to find out what works and then we're going to go do it. And he says exactly the same thing about education. We're going to go study it, find out what works, and then go do it. The only difference is in education, we've been trying to do this for 25 years with no success. And in healthcare, we're just now starting with no success. We've had um, three times the Congressional Budget Office has looked at the pilot programs and demonstration projects. And three times it said it, they aren't working. You know, we can find centers of excellence, we can find people who are doing great things, but they're not getting produced in these demonstration projects. Why? Because they're designed in Washington. You, you point to me a center of excellence, show me a hospital, show me a doctor practice that's really good, that has uh, low cost and high quality, and, and, and I can almost guarantee you it was created on the supply side of the market. I don't know a single example 
where one was created by the buyers of health care. Now let's talk about the rest of Obamacare for just a moment. Um, everybody asks me what I think is going to happen. I think there are six problems with this legislation that are so big that even if all the Republicans go home, uh, the Democrats who voted for this bill are going to want to change something to deal with these six problems. And the first one is one you already know about. You're going to be required to buy a pretty expensive health insurance plan. And what you may not realize is the cost of that plan is going to be growing at twice the rate of growth of your income. Now, Barack Obama didn't create the problem. We've been doing this for 40 years. Uh, for four decades, health care spending has been growing twice as fast as our income. And we're not the worst in the world. In fact, we're kind of right in the middle of the European average. But here's the thing. You don't have to be an economist or a mathematician or have a pocket calculator to realize that if something's growing twice as fast as your income, it's going to crowd out everything else you're consuming. As a matter of fact, uh, if we stay on this path, the days college students will reach retirement age and they'll have nothing to eat, nothing to wear, no place to live, but they have lots and lots of health care. <laughs> um, clearly, that's not where we want to go. And clearly, we can't keep people on that path. Uh, again, Obama didn't create the problem, but the legislation kind of locks us in because it going to prevent you from doing a lot of things you would normally do if insurance premiums were going up in some other area. You, you'd probably have a higher deductible or more limited coverage, and you're just not going to be able to do that. Second problem is a bizarre system of subsidies. Uh, people, hotel down the street, I don't know if you've ever noticed, if you look around a hotel, most of the people you're looking at make about $15 an hour. These are the maids, the waitresses, the waiters, the busboys, the custodial folks. I mean, at best they're making about 30000 a year. Obamacare is going to require that hotel to provide insurance. The family coverage is going to cost $15,000. That's half of what these employees earn. I can see the meeting now with the employees. We've got bad news and good news. The bad news is that we're going to cut your wage in half. And the good news is you get Obamacare. Uh, this is a train wreck, and um, there is no new subsidy in the legislation for that hotel or those employees. But on the other hand, they're going to create a new health insurance exchange for people who don't get health insurance from an employer. So if there's a way that this hotel can think of to get the employees over to this exchange, the government's going to pay 98% of the premium. So we have you know, almost a $15,000 giveaway over here, a $15,000 burden over there, and I have a feeling the employees are going to get over here. It's the economist in me telling me that. Uh, I don't know how. Maybe, maybe the employer makes them all you know, part-time workers so, so they don't even count under the mandate or, or independent contractors. Or maybe the hotel divides into separate corporations where the low average wage workers don't get health insurance. The employer pays the fine, which is $2,000, sends them over to get a $15,000 benefit. What I haven't mentioned yet is if you're a higher income worker, we have to reverse all of this. If, if you have a manager at this hotel making $100,000, um, he gets nothing if he goes over in the health insurance exchange. There's no subsidy at all. But if the employer provides insurance, those employer premiums are pre-tax, which means they avoid a 25% uh, federal income tax, a 15% uh, FICA tax, a four or five, I don't know what your state income tax here is, but, but you add it up and you'll find <coughs> that the tax subsidy is worth almost half the cost of the insurance. So uh, the rule is above average income folks are going to want their employer insurance and below average are going to go in exchange. I don't know how they're going to get there, but I know if one hotel figures out how to do it, uh, its cost, labor cost will be 50% uh, 50 below the competitors, and so then they all will do it. And um, here's what's bad about that. We're going to find companies, we're going to find the entire industrial structure of the United States changing with companies dividing and coming together based on health insurance subsidies instead of real economics. And that's not the way you maintain efficient competitiveness in an international economy. Third problem are the exchanges themselves. Um, in the exchanges, uh, uh, insurers have to charge the same premium to everybody regardless of expected health costs. And you don't even have to be in the business to know that if that's uh, the way uh, it's going to work, that these companies are going to make profits on healthy people and losses on sick people. 
And so uh, what are they going to do? They're going to try to attract the healthy and avoid the sick. Uh, but the perverse incentives don't stop at the point of enrollment, but they keep on going. So that once people have enrolled, the incentive is to overprovide to the healthy because you want to keep the ones you have and attract more of them, and underprovide to the sick because you don't want the ones you have, you certainly don't want to attract more of them. I don't know how many of you ever stop and consider that the healthcare system uh, is not only bureaucratic, but it can be quite hostile to people who have problems. And most of you right now have a protector and defender if you're getting insurance from an employer, if you get it to a broker, well that employer, that broker, is your protector and a defender in a very hostile, potentially hostile system. Uh, but what happens when the broker goes away, as they almost certainly are, and what if the employer goes away too, as many of them will for many people, then you're on your own. And um, if you're on your own in this system, we don't really want to set it up so that everybody has perverse incentives from history to say. Fourth problem, we overpromise. This, this, uh, we, we promise more than we're willing to pay for. Uh, in another year and a half, 30 million people or so are going to be newly insured. And if the economic studies are correct, they'll try to double their consumption of health care. Even more uh, impactful than that, all the rest of you are going to have to have insurance which is more generous than what you otherwise would have wanted. There's a whole long list of preventive services that you're going to have in your insurance plan with no deductible and no program. <coughs> Uh, economists at Duke uh, estimated that if everybody in America got all of these preventive services, it would take the average primary care physician seven and a half hours of every working day just to provide them, with virtually no time left to do anything else. What I'm describing is a huge potential increase in demand, no change in supply, and so we're going to have a big rationing problem, just as they have had in, in Massachusetts. You know, Governor Romney told me way back when that um, once the plan got underway, we wouldn't have people going to the hospital emergency rooms for their care. Uh, they would go to primary care physicians where it's cheaper, more convenient, and so forth. Uh, and I think what he and the others didn't ask themselves was, well, if more people are going to get more care, who's going to deliver the more care? You know, if you don't have any more doctors, you don't have any more nurses, no more clinics, wh where's this new care going to come from? Um, you ever gone to a primary care physician's office and seen a lot of people standing around with nothing to do? You know, there are not a lot of idle resources in most doctor's offices. And we're going to see this nationwide. And uh, in this environment, it's not going to be good for you if you're in a plan that pays less than what all the other plans are paying. And who is in a plan that pays less than what other plans are paying? It's seniors and the disabled on Medicare, poor people on Medicaid, and if Massachusetts is the example, new people in subsidized health insurance uh, in the exchanges. Who are these people? These are the most vulnerable people in our society. Um, I bet anything that the Democrats that voted for this legislation thought they were trying to help these people. In fact, I know they did because I've testified and they're telling me that. I just had to remind them that um, if you don't create more doctors, you usually don't get more care. And uh, what's going to happen here is that these people are going to be pushed into the waiting lines. For senior citizens, how many of you have a, whether you're senior or not, how many of you have a concierge doctor? Okay. Uh, quite a few. Uh, but still, what? One, two percent of the crowd? How many of you know what one is? All right, okay. <laughs> so the concierge doctor, you pay him typically another $1,500, $2,000 a year. You get same day, next day service. He's your agent in the system. Uh, uh, he talk, usually talks to you by phone or email, um, but he's only seeing about 500 patients as opposed to 2,500 <coughs> that the normal doctor sees. So when a doctor becomes a concierge doctor, he takes 500 patients with him and leaves, leaves 2,000 behind. Great for the 500, not good for the 2,000 left behind. And we're going to see very, very quickly two-tier medicine in the United States. If you can afford it, you're going to get prompt care without a lot of waiting. And if you can't afford it, you're going to be waiting in line. Uh, the last problem is the Medicare problem. Um, it's really true, and you wouldn't know it with all the confusing, misleading ads going back and forth, but it's really true that um, Obamacare is in, in large part paid for by taking money out of Medicare. $716 billion over the next 10 years. How are they going to take it out of Medicare? They're going to push down prices for providers and hospitals. 
The Medicare chief actuary has already told us what this is going to mean. By the end of the decade, one in seven hospitals are going to have to leave the system. Within just a few years, Medicare will pay less than Medicaid to doctors. Its rate will drop to the Medicaid rate for hospitals. For doctors, senior citizens will be less desirable from a financial point of view uh, than welfare mothers. Koki Roberts said on TV the other day, there's no way this will happen. Well, if Congress reverses it, that means we didn't pay for any of this. And that means deficits keep going on forever. But if they don't do that, if they keep this in place, then senior citizens are going to have a lot of their health care ration. Now, what should we do? I was in Washington uh, this summer, and I suggested to the House Republican uh, and Democrat uh, Doctors Caucus uh, a health contract with America. And I said, let's start by treating everybody fairly. Instead of these wildly different subsidies that we have under the current system and they're, they're going to get worse under Obamacare, uh, why don't we just take all of this money and give everybody the same tax relief when they purchase health insurance? And I would guess that right now we could probably have $2,500 for an adult, $8,000 for a family, and that's a refundable tax credit. You get it even if you don't owe income taxes, but only if you have health insurance. Now, the typical employer, a large employer at least, is spending $16,000. Your tax credit's only eight. So that means the second 8,000 you and your employer pay, that's all after tax money. The government would only be subsidizing the core insurance that we want everybody to have. Everything else is on your dime. But that would immediately change everybody's thinking because if you knew that it was $8,000 extra for extra benefits going to healthcare, but you could take that 8000 you could take it home and spend it on anything else you want to, then all of you would begin to think very carefully <coughs> about what you're really getting for the second 8000 And I think we would see a very radical change in health insurance almost overnight. Then we need to make health insurance portable. You know, when you poll people, of all the things they complain about, is lack of portability is the biggest one. But in this state right now, it is illegal for an employer to buy for his employees health insurance, which they own and can take with them to the next job and in and out of the labor market. We've outlawed portable insurance. The employer has to buy group insurance, which means the kind of insurance that you lose when you leave uh, that place of work. Uh, we just need to turn this around. I don't mean to say it's easy. It, you have to think it through carefully. But we ought to be encouraging portable insurance, not outlawing it. And then we need generous health savings accounts. Uh, they're already in the law now, but we need to expand it. We need to make it, make it easy for employers and insurers to create health and sa savings accounts for the chronically ill. Lots of studies show that people with chronic conditions can manage a lot of their own care, the diabetics, the asthmatics. They need some training, but they can manage their own care and with results as good or better than traditional care. And if we're going to ask them to do that, we need to ask them to, we need to give them the ability to manage the money that pays for that care uh, as, as well. And then finally, we need real insurance. And um, most of you probably haven't stopped to think about it, uh, but we don't have real insurance uh, in healthcare. Uh, I would just ask you to compare the television ads you see for casualty insurance with what you know in the health insurance world. Casualty insurance is where the black actor is on TV and he's standing and there's a town behind him that's been destroyed and he says, it only took two minutes to destroy this town. And then he says, are you in good hands? That's, that's an Allstate ad. Uh, what's the message there? We know you don't care about insurance until something bad happens. <coughs> when a bad thing happens, Allstate will be there, right? All the Aflac ads, every one of them is about stuff going wrong. And it's all saying when the bad stuff happens, Aflac will be there. My favorite print ad is the Chubb ad where the guy is fishing and he's about to back over in his canoe over Niagara Falls. And the tagline is, insurance doesn't matter until it does. Again, the message is pretty much the same. You probably have never seen a health insurance ad. Uh, but folks in Washington are seeing them, or they soon will be, in the open season where they get to choose among plans with the same community rating, same price for everybody, regardless of risk. And um, so the federal employees will see ads on local TV and the Washington Post and the Hill, other publications that federal employees uh, look at. What do those ads look like? Do you think they talk about AIDS or heart disease or cancer? Do you think they talk about why people really need health insurance? No. What those ads picture are families that are young and healthy and smiling and look like they have no need for health care at all. And so the implicit message is, if you look like this family, we, we want you. 
But if you don't look like them, we may not have a good fit. Um, so what's happening there? Same thing I discussed earlier. You give the insurance industry perverse incentives, you're going to get perverse outcomes. They're going to try to attract the healthy and avoid the sick. Um, what I mean by real insurance is being able to insure for pre-existing conditions. When I buy life insurance, then I get my prostate cancer test. It turns out bad for me. Uh, my premium doesn't go up. I don't get kicked out of the pool. Uh, if, uh, uh, if for some reason then the, the cancer kills me, uh, uh, my, my, my family gets, gets the proceeds. Um, uh, that's the way insurance is supposed to work. In healthcare, it's not working that way. So what I mean by real insurance is you be, should be able to insure against the possibility that you will develop a pre-existing condition. 90% of the pre-existing condition problems will go away if insurance were just portable. But if you have to leave one plan and go to another, if you've been paying premiums to a plan for many, many years, that plan should pay the higher premium to the new plan if you develop a health condition uh, that has worsened and makes you a higher risk. Um, we need that, I call it the health contract in America. What I said to the doctors was, don't come up with a 2,700 page bill right before an election. Nobody will understand that. Nobody understands Obamacare. Uh, but they can understand a few simple ideas and, um, uh, and that's what I would propose to you. Now, your assignment for tonight. Um, I have a health alert which I uh, send out by email. I do it twice a week. And if you want to receive it, it takes you back to my blog. All I need is an email address. So just give me a business card, give me an email address, and you have that. Um, we have something else we send out every business day. It's called Daily Policy Digest. Newt Gingrich says it's the best thing he gets. Uh, C. Forbes says the same thing. Uh, this goes out to thousands of people every morning. Uh, it summarizes public policy research. And it, you see about five sentences. This is what you're going to get if you like if you're interested in the topic, you click on it. It says, here's a study. Here are the two or three findings. If you want the whole study, we give you another link. Um, if you are interested in public policy, uh, give me an email address and, and you can have that. Now, I'm going to wrap up and give you a chance uh, to tell me what you think. I think if you say as many controversial things that I've said in the last 50 minutes, that you've got to give people at least some opportunity to, uh, to ask a question or say something back to you. But let me just close by saying I was introduced as the father of health savings accounts. I think the most important thing about the health savings accounts is not so much that it puts money in the hands of the patient, but that it empowers patients. Um, we are living in a, with a potentially hostile bureaucratic system. And I think you will find that if you retain the money and you retain the power to make your own decisions, this system is going to work better for you that if you see that money and that power to someone else. Thank you very much. Okay, there's no feedback. Yes. Uh, let's get to some questions for Dr. Goodman. First of all, you've talked about this extensively. Let's talk about one that we have a uh, question we've got. If you still have some other questions, that you think of while we're speaking, we do have a few minutes. If you jot them down uh, and send them to our staff, people will be happy to ask them. Is any part of the Affordable Care Act salvageable? Well, you know, there's one thing about the Affordable Care Act that I kind of like, and that is the federal risk pool. Uh, because basically for the last year or two years, uh, just about anybody in America who has a pre-existing condition problem, and that, by that I mean if you've been uninsured for six months and the regular insurers are turning you down because you've got a health problem, you can go into the federal risk pool and you pay the same premium that a healthy person would pay and get very, very decent insurance. When the Democrats passed this legislation, they talked as though there were millions of such people. As it turns out, there are only 77,000. Uh, now they're sick, they're expensive, they're costing about five billion dollars over ten years, but uh, or the next few years. But five billion dollars is tiny compared to the trillion dollar cost of Obamacare. So for the time being, while we do the kind of insurance reforms that I would like to see, that is a reasonable stopgap that I'd like to see the Republicans keep in place, and it solves the pro it solves the problem that the backers of this legislation talked about the most on the eve of its passage and ever since. You touched on this um, 
briefly, but one person in our audience wants to know the difference between Obamacare and healthcare program in Massachusetts. Hmm. <laughs> well, uh, there is some truth to what the president says when he says he, he used Massachusetts as the model. They did. Uh, and not only that, but the Massachusetts model came largely from the Heritage Foundation. That's true, too. So, so Obama can, can sort of trace the, uh, uh, the line uh, all the way back to, to Washington, the conservative think tank people. Uh, but the fact is that, um, that the Massachusetts experiment is a state program. Uh, they don't have control over the federal tax law. Uh, they don't have the power that the federal uh, government has. And so it does some of the same bad things. I'll tell you, uh, two years ago, Governor Romney was in Dallas, and I had 600 people out to hear him, and he got two standing ovations. And I sat down with him, and I said, look, you, you could be the leader of Republicans on health care. You just need to do two things. You need to get up and say, here are three things that we did in Massachusetts that are really good. And here are three other things that are not so good. And, um, and I even wrote it down and emailed it to him. And I said, well, if you just say that, people will... You know, hey, you're a businessman. You tried this and it worked. Tried that and it didn't work. Everybody will understand. He hasn't done it. I think that's been a mistake. I must say the writing from the members of our audience is as bad as mine. <laughs> I'm glad. Or you're all doctors, one or the other. <laughs> um, are health exchanges bad or just the way they are a part of Obamacare? Uh, all health exchanges, and I'm talking about the federal employee system right now, the Massachusetts system and what's about to happen under Obamacare. Everything's bad if you allow people to move back and forth between plans at a premium that has nothing to do with the cost of their care. Because if you do that, you're going to have plans very, very tempted to dump their sick people on some other plan. Now, when I said, you know, underprovide to the sick, I mean mistreat the sick, uh, encourage them to go somewhere else. Okay? And that's what plans will do. But on the other hand, if a sick person leaves your plan and goes to another plan, and you have to pay the cost of that person being above average sick to the new plan, then your incentives change. And so the key is not that it's an exchange. It's that the prices at which people move are unrelated to their costs. We want to make the prices as close to possible reflecting the cost, and that we, that's how you create a market to take care of the problems of sick people. Okay, here we go. This is the, uh, I guess it's multi-billion dollar question. Can we avoid politics when it comes to solving this issue? You've spoken, obviously, you at Capitol kidding. Hill many times. You've talked to a lot of politicians. Why don't the politicians seem to be listening and taking the advice of the educated in elections? Oh, listen, when Obamacare passed, uh, they didn't listen to us at all. Uh, they also didn't listen very carefully to the intellectuals who or on the other side, if you like. Um, what happened was it was total special interest legislation, and they went to the lawyer, they, they went to the, the doctors and the hospitals and the drug companies and the device industry, and they said, every one of them, you better come to the table. If you don't come to the table, you're going to be the lunch. So every one of them did. They all sold out their members, and then they went around the table and said, okay, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want? By the time they made the circle, they had a Rube Goldberg contraption that nobody would have ever thought of on its own. I mean, Obamacare is so weird, and it has the, many of the problems I'm talking about, precisely because that's the way it was legislated. It, it wasn't people sitting down saying, what would a good health care system look like? It was, how do we satisfy these special interests? What's, what's the most thing the hospitals want? What's the most thing the drug companies want? And of course, now all those people who sold out their members are finding out that you do a deal with the devil, and you find out that the devil doesn't didn't really have any interest in keeping the deal. So all these people uh, that thought they were going to get something uh, may find out they get nothing. What can we do to bolster preventative medicine? Well, First of all, let me say that I think preventive medicine is good, it's, a, it's an investment in your health, but I think most people understand that preventive medicine does not save money. Uh, you go out and give people, you know, women a thousand mammograms, you might find somebody with cancer, you might catch that cancer in its early stages, and you save on the health care costs for that one person, but you, you know, the other 999 women were healthy and the cost of giving screenings to healthy people overwhelms any savings that you get on the sick. 
So I believe, and also you, for, for every test that you can name, whether it's a mammogram or pap smear or prostate cancer or colonoscopies, you find that the people are out there arguing about it, and they've been arguing about these tests for 20 years. And there's, a, there's a new study here, a new study there. We, the, the, this, this, the medical community is not together on what should be done here. They're arguing with each other. So this is a perfect environment in which you want to let people make their own decisions. You don't want to dictate from the White House how many tests each of us should get. That's what killed Hillary care. <coughs> Hillary Clinton, it wasn't anything else other than that. Hillary Clinton decided that from the White House, she was going to decide how often women were going to get mammograms and pap smears. And it just so happened that the procedures that she, or the frequency that she uh, decided on, was different than what most doctors were telling their female patients. And that, more than anything else, turned the public against the bill, and it failed. And it just astounded me that, um, it astounded me uh, that, that the people in Washington are, are, uh, uh, have the attitude that they want to tell everybody what to do, down to the tiniest detail. For We see this in Obamacare, down to contraceptives. Um, what is going through their minds if they think they have to tell us about all these little things that have to be in our health plan? Sorry, that was long-winded. That's all right. That's fine. You've got the floor, as they say. Would it be safe to say, would it be safe to say that those who don't take care of themselves should pay more pre-existing conditions aside? Well, that was my opinion. But I certainly don't want to see it legislated. <coughs> so if you want a private insurance plan that says, look, you keep your weight down, you don't smoke, you don't abuse yourself in various ways, uh, then you're going to have a lower premium path. You want to do all those other things, you're going to have a higher premium path. That would not bother me. Uh, but it needs, to, it needs to happen in the private marketplace. It should not be dictated by government. And, um, uh, and, the, and the, I think that that's, that's probably makes sense. Some people are predicting, as you know, that uh, Obamacare is going to be here for a good while, despite the protests of a lot of folks. How will Obamacare change our nation in 10 years? Well, uh, you know, in some ways, there's going to be less change than all of you think. <laughs> you know, we, all of you started out with insurance before there was ever Obamacare. And uh, basically, all it's doing is saying you're going to have to have more benefits than you had before, so that's going to raise your costs. Plus, there's going to be enormous pressure on doctors to practice evidence-based medicine, which means cookbook medicine. And that's the quality problem. Um, and you won't notice it very quickly, but over time, uh, you're going to find that doctors are treating patients with the same condition the same way, almost regardless, because to treat them in some other way is, is too much of a hassle. Just as an aside, I think it's really interesting. In the New York Times over the last uh, month or so, there have been a series of articles about genes and personalized medicine. If you, if you miss those, they're, they're worth going back and just, just Googling. Where the science is going and where the technology is going is toward personalized medicine. Um, you have cancer, they're going to be able to use your genetic makeup to, to, to find the drug that will cure your cancer. Uh, for eye cancer already, they can just do one genetic test, and from that test, they can tell you whether you're going to live or die. And if you're going to die, there's no point in going through the chemotherapy and all that pain and agony because you're not going to make it anyway. But if it goes the other way, then you have a really good chance of, uh, of survival. You know what Zeke, you know who Zeke Emanuel is? He's, he was the <coughs> health advisor to the Obama administration during the time when uh, the law was passed. He said to CNN the other day, personalized medicine is a myth. Uh, we can't afford it, and uh, uh, we ought to quit thinking about it. All right. And see, from his point of view, the only way we can control health care costs is to treat everybody the same. If you treat everybody the same, you can have protocols written in Washington, you can tell the doctors, you follow this protocol, we'll pay you more. You deviate, we'll pay you less. Personalized medicine goes in the opposite direction. So Obamacare is going over here, personalized medicine is going over there. Remember what I said about two-tiered medicine? If you can afford it, you'll be over here, and if you can't, you'll be over here. All right, given that, here's a question for you. Do you predict a gray or black market developing to work around ACA? Well, you can call it a, a gray or black market, but essentially concierge payment is a way for you and your doctor to step outside the system. <coughs> and what I just said about personalized medicine, that's another way to step outside the system. Um, 
uh, right now, it, it, we're not like Canada. In Canada, this would be illegal. Okay? So it would have to be a black market. But, but that, right now, that's not part of Obamacare. You know, they, they do allow you to step outside the system and pay a doctor to do things uh, that you can't get from normal health insurance. But yes, of course, that's going to happen in, in, to a huge degree. Okay, we've got time for one more question. Why not establish government health care clinics for use by Medicaid, indigents, and those without insurance instead of having them use hospital emergency rooms? Okay. Well, in a sense, we're kind of doing it. Uh, we have community health centers, and their whole purpose is to be an alternative to the hospital emergency room. But you have to understand, in both cases, we're still rationing by waiting. Uh, since the people aren't paying with money, they're paying with time. Now, time is valuable even to poor people. And that's why I want to open up the minute clinics. The minute clinics are there to provide a low cost, quick, high quality service. Medicaid would save money if it would just, uh, yeah, actually Medicaid would save money if it would just pay the market price of minute clinics. But if you tell me you don't have the money to do that, then let the low income person add from his pocketbook the additional money to pay the market price, and um, that's the best solution of all. Dr. Goodman, we all want to thank you very much for tonight.